Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, and I am so glad to be here with you again for this week's episode, which is a really cool interview with another amazing woman in the middle about how to up-level your career and find another job in midlife. My guest today successfully navigated this whole new online employment search landscape several times and is happy to share some solid strategies that you can easily use yourself. Today, we meet Danielle Bradley, who believes strongly that midlife is a great time for women to uplevel their careers. As a midlife gal herself, she has been there, done that when it comes to reinventing herself a couple of times with her career in midlife. After a sudden layoff in her mid-40s, looking for work for months with only one interview that led nowhere, Danielle figured out exactly what she was doing wrong in her search and ended up getting a ton of job offers in 24 hours. Wait till you hear the story. She landed an amazing role, and today she helps others up-level their careers and is super passionate about helping midlife women create their dream careers. As a career coach, she combines practical how-to strategies with the most effective coaching tools that inspire you into action. Danielle has a proven track record of helping motivated and ambitious professionals up-level their careers and get the new job or promotions that they want and deserve. I know you're going to love hearing Danielle's story and amazing strategies. So without further ado, I can't wait for you to meet this very special woman in the middle. Enjoy the interview. Hi, Danielle. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Women in the Middle podcast. Hi, Susie. I'm so excited to be here. I was super excited to have you here because I can't tell you how many amazing women in the middle are in a tiz about looking for a new job at our age. So I know that you have done that successfully a few times. So I'm really excited to ask you some very specific questions about how you did that. Because the last time I looked for a job, I got it out of the newspaper. I answered a newspaper ad. That's what I did too. I know we're going back in time now, but uh, yes, as a midlife gal myself, I did find an amazing job eventually uh, way back when in a newspaper ad and I almost didn't apply for it. It was so tiny and it looked like it really wasn't much of a role, but I thought, you know what, I'm just going to apply for it. And it actually led to an amazing career in the end. But yeah, um, we're going back in time here. (laughs) It's so funny because I think I did that four times. When I graduated from grad school, I moved to Toronto to to start the first job that I got out of the newspaper. And then it was several jobs and they were in the national newspaper in Canada. It was called the Globe and Mail. That's where I found them. And you know, where you have to reference that number and in old fashioned letters and resumes that were printed where you had to like print a hundred of them and then you'd find a typo and it was like a nightmare. You had to pick the type of stationery. It was just so different. I know. And you had to get a stamp and you had to mail it out and you know, (laughs) times have changed a lot. (laughs) They have changed a lot. And that is really why I think there's so much confusion because so many of us, like I was in my last job for 19 years and you know, two decades, the internet happened and so many changes and you're right. It's a completely different landscape. But before we dive into the specifics, Can you tell us a little bit about what was going on for you in your 40s? What was happening? For sure. In my 40s, I was actually in that role um, that I had found through the newspaper ad. Actually, the company got acquired by another company. And, you know, I ended up being with them for uh, just about 13 years. And, um, you know, I did come to a place where I had gotten promoted. It was a really good career that I was able to uh, get from that. Um, I went from, you know, being in customer service to being in sales leadership role. But, you know, I came to a point being with the same company for so long where I was starting to feel stagnant, not very fulfilled, but, you know, I had a lot of fear attached to making a move. 
And so even though, you know, that career at that time wasn't really, um, you know, checking all the boxes for me anymore, I had a lot of fear attached with making a change. And so, you know, oh, hang on a minute about fear. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about that, because that was what happened to me, too. But I didn't really understand the fear. So how did you figure out what you were afraid of? Well, I was afraid of, um, I guess, I felt like I had grown up with that company. I had had some amazing mentors that had, uh, I had learned a lot from. And there was probably some fear attached to, could I really make it somewhere else, right? Without these people that had helped and supported me, right? Could I just really come into a brand new company and do as well as I had done for those 13 years? I think that's where a lot of it came from. Yes, and it's funny that you mentioned that because with me, it was also related a bit to seniority and how I was interpreting my long-term position there. I thought it was value added and I thought I'm better and I'm making more of a contribution because of my long-term employment. But I realized that my fear was really about questioning that. And if I'd made uh, a bad decision by staying at the same place, if that's why I was feeling so stagnant, just all kinds of questions related to my interpretation of long-term employment at one place. Right. It's true. I mean, there is that sense of security when you've been somewhere for a while. And I know too, you know, probably like you at the back of my mind, I thought, well, if something happens, the company has a downturn or something like that, I get a big package and I'll have all this time, right, to figure out what I want to do next. Well, that's not how it worked out for me. <laughs> that's a, I used to fantasize about that. And that's also not how it worked out for me. So what happened next? What was it that happened or that you started to think about that propelled you into this, this new reality of looking for a new job? Well, actually, I, I, in that particular instance, I ended up having a recruiter contact me about another job opportunity. And, you know, when I say he contacted me, I mean, he was pretty much, uh, he convinced me to go meet with another company and go in for an interview. And so I did that. And in spite of having all this fear, I went and interviewed and it did present a really good opportunity, kind of a reduction in my commute. And it was more of a lateral move. But I thought, you know, the time had come that I really needed to kind of face that fear, do it anyway, make a move. And, um, you know, it worked out really well in the end. It was a good move at the time. And it led to the biggest promotion in my career, actually. <laughs> wow. And yeah. how long did you stay there? I was there just under five years. And uh, that's when there was a bit of a downturn in the economy and the company. And, you know, much like you, I went through a really, in my case, it was a very sudden layoff. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I paused because <laughs> it was a shock and uh, I really wasn't prepared for it at the time. Oh my gosh. I'm having a flashback to that knock on the door that I heard. And I remember it like I was... Not, I was really looking or I was confused. I didn't know what I was doing at that point, but I knew that I was not happy. I wasn't content anymore, uh, but there was no active plan in motion. And I remember getting my coffee that day and I was at my desk and I was just trying to enjoy the way my job had been working out and what I had planned for the day. And I, it was very boring what I had to do that morning. But I was kind of into it. I was listening to the radio. And then I got a knock on the door and it was like slow motion. I looked up <laughs> and my manager, who had just been my manager for about two weeks, he was my colleague for over 10 years. And I looked up and he had a funny look on his face. It was kind of like he didn't say anything, but I had a pit in my stomach as soon as I heard him or saw him, heard the knock, saw him. And then he said, we need you for a meeting. Uh -oh. And then I just knew, I'm like, is this meeting with HR? <laughs> and then it was the walk of silence to the other side of the building. It was so far away. It was a, a crazy moment, but I just had that flashback. So thank you very much. It was <laughs> harsh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, it was, I remember too, when it happened for me, everything was in slow motion, right? And it just felt so surreal. Yeah. It did feel surreal. And, and like I said, I'd been fantasizing about it for a while. But when it happens, it's 
it's, I guess it's like the epitome of rejection and fear. And I remember thinking to myself, even during the meeting with the HR reps and, and the VP of the department, or I don't even remember his title, but like the big wigs and the union reps, I was in a union. I kept thinking to myself, I think this is a good thing. But with my heart beating so loudly, <laughs> it didn't feel like a good thing at all. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, it's great that we can laugh about it now. There is life on the other side of the layoff. <laughs> well, I really do believe that it, uh, it always opens the door to something better happening. And I guess because you can really see what's possible once the dust settles. And for me, it's been six years. Uh, it was six years last May, and it feels almost like an eternity ago. And I have never been happier or more satisfied in my life with, with my career. That is for sure. So I do believe it was a gift. Yes, me too. Absolutely. So then what happened? How did you handle that phase? Well, you know, I, I, at the time I was living by myself. I had a mortgage, you know, it was uh, post-divorce that this happened. And so once I got over the shock, I started really actively looking, but, you know, I never had to conduct a job search in the age of the internet. Times had changed. The other job that I had gotten, as I mentioned, you know, I got through a recruiter uh, that sought me out. And so I just went and, you know, did that old um, sort of, uh, I applied to a ton of different positions online, on LinkedIn. You know, I didn't really know what I was doing. I had a good resume. I had good experience. Um, and I had had some help with an outplacement agency uh, when I got laid off. But it wasn't working. I got, in the first six months, I got one job interview. Wow. With all that experience and all your ducks supposedly in a row. So how did you solve that problem? How did you figure out what you could do better? Well, one of the things I did, and it didn't solve the problem directly, but you know, I saw the summer kind of coming along and I thought, okay, chances are it's going to be tough this summer, you know, maybe there's not going to be a lot of activities. And I thought to myself, what would I like to have done by the time September comes along, right? What would I have liked to have accomplished beyond just looking for a new job? And I heard about the life coach school and coach training. And that's when I did my coach training. So I was just really happy that I did that. And it did help me a lot with what came next. And what came next was really figuring out, you know, how to conduct an effective job search nowadays. And uh, it ended up leading to dozens of interviews with several different companies. And in the end, after months of working at it, I did get three job offers all within 24 hours of one another, of course. Oh, oh my gosh. So <laughs> wait, you've just unpacked so much. We have to go back for a second. Of so. course. I did meet you at the Life Coach School. It was kind of like we were just attracted to each other. We ended up on the same flight yeah. and it was just super fun to meet you there. And I love how you started to think about what would I like to have accomplished by this period of time, which is really regret proofing, which is what I go on and on about all the time. Yeah. How can I use this time to the best of my ability? What are all the things I can do to make sure that I don't have any regrets? So you were still productive. Now, when you were uh, going after the life coach certification, were you thinking that this is an amazing time for me to work on myself? I want to be a life coach full time. I want to use these new skills to uplevel my career. Like, what was your intention when you made the decision to train to be a life coach? I would say I didn't have a very, very clear picture of what I wanted to do with it. But I knew this is something that I was just attracted to. It's something that spoke to me. I had benefited from working with an executive coach in the corporate world, in the company, one of the companies I was with prior to that. And I had learned so much from that work. It was 18 months that I will always be grateful for. And I thought, you know, there's a lot to this coaching world, right? And there's skills that I would just love to learn and perhaps apply in the future, perhaps you know, at work or in a capacity of being a coach myself. And two, as a manager of people, there were some things that um, I found kind of frustrating that I felt like I couldn't help my employees kind of work through. And I thought, you know, the life coaching tools perhaps could really help me with that too. Oh my God, that's amazing yeah. insight. And I love how you kind of went there not knowing all the answers because one of the things that comes up all the time with my clients is, 
they feel so stuck because they're waiting to have all those ducks in a row. They want to know everything. And it's impossible to have all the answers when you're on this kind of a transformation. I really think that just that ability to lean in a little bit and be more curious and just trust that you're going to grow, that the process itself is a valued part of the experience, it can really change everything. For sure. And that's how I like to think about it too, is leaning into those things that we're attracted to. And I do have to give some kudos to my mom too, because she really encouraged me when the question came up, you know, should I invest right now? I'm unemployed. I have to invest all this money to go through coach certification. Should I do it? And she was, you know, such a supporter. (laughs) Okay. Yay, mom. Let's do a shout out to all the moms out there because we need them. And that's so great. I love that you just did that. All right. So now getting back to that unbelievable thing that you just said, that you had three job offers within 24 hours. Okay. What happened to produce that result? I think it was just really once I learned what was working in terms of uh, producing interviews and how to do well in interviews, it just... um, you know, culminated in that situation where I had the three job offers lined up. I mean, one of them was even from um, a company out of town, actually, and it completely, it was in Montreal. And so um, having had done, though, the homework of really getting clear on what I was looking for, it helped me decide, you know, which position I should accept in the end. So tell me a little bit more about that. What was your process for figuring out that clarity, like for making those decisions and dialing that in? For sure. Well, I think it is important to get clear on your uh, career goals before you set out to do anything, whether it is, you know, even making a change or staying, staying in the same, with the same company, the same role, or making a change, getting that clarity is what sets the stage for everything else. Right. And I, I do see that a lot with the people that I work with now, um, where, you know, people looking for a new job will say, the first thing I need to do is update my resume. Actually, that is not the ideal first step. You want to decide first what type of company, what type of role, the culture, um, you know, is there a work-life balance that you'd like to have perhaps that you're not experiencing today? And having that, you know, really clear, um, I think you have a better chance of attracting as well what you're looking for when you have that level of clarity. You know, one of the things I love about being our age and being at our stage is that we are older and wiser. And I think having the experience that we have in general helps us determine what we want better now than ever before. I know so many of my clients say, I don't know what I want. I don't know what my passion is. I'm so confused, blah, blah, blah. But the bottom line is when you believe that you have that wisdom, you will have that wisdom. You'll be able to access that wisdom. And I just have such faith and belief in older and wiser women having a better uh, capability to understand what it is they want. I just get so, I hate to say it, but like, well, my listeners have heard this before. I get giddy with excitement. (laughs) at the opportunity and possibility that's out there because we are wiser. Did you find that, that at uh, being older, that you were able to access uh, that, that inner wisdom better? For sure. Yeah. There's uh, just more depth, right? To exactly. We know ourselves so much better in that self-awareness, I think is something not only that serves us, but that also is appealing to some employers. <laughs> Exactly. It's not just that we have, um, you know, that we're over 50 or that we're getting older. When we're feeling insecure, that's what we focus on. But you're right. Employers are wise to what older and wiser people bring to the table. So the other thing that you said that's interesting is that you increased your skill in being better at being able to tap into prospective employers' minds. Now, how did you do that? Well, part of that actually is... uh, I I like to call it, you know, becoming a mind reader. (laughs) And the way to do that now is it's become kind of easy to do this online when you're looking through job descriptions, whether they're posted on a job board or 
um, on company websites or on LinkedIn for that matter, you can really look for themes in those job descriptions. You can look for themes in interview questions. And those give you clues to some of the problems that the employer is trying to solve by hiring for that particular position. And so you're kind of able to get under the hood of what they're looking for, and then you're able to position yourself as that solution and that person that is going to solve those problems. Oh, that's so good. Can you remember a specific example of something that you noticed as you were doing that comparison? Yes, I found that they were lacking the specific um, breadth of experience, actually, that I had in order. This was a sales position, uh, a senior sales position that I ended up accepting at the time. And uh, my manager at the time was actually a little bit younger and less experienced than I was. And but he was smart enough to, ne- to know he needed experienced people on his team that were going to make him look good. And so I was able to present myself as that person that, you know, could accept to work with someone who had a little less experience as me, but I had so much to offer. And, you know, it ended up being kind of a really good partnership that lasted for a number of years. That is so good. I love how you used your age to uh, your advantage. And the breadth, I mean, of course you had the breadth of experience. You didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday, as my grandma used to say. (laughs) Okay, Danielle, but come on, three job offers in 24 hours, you must have been doing something else. Like one of the things that um, I really felt when I was in that same job for 19 years is I was like, am I current anymore? And I have a feeling that something about being current must have happen to you. (laughs) Tell me more about that. For sure. I think it is important to make sure that you look current and that you look relevant. And, you know, that means on paper, online, uh, through your resume, with your cover letter and your LinkedIn profile. And, you know, there's little things in there that, um, you know, we learned probably 20, 25 years ago that are not used so much nowadays. For instance, um, things on your resume like uh, putting a, an objective section on your resume or saying something like references available upon request. <laughs> I didn't realize that that's not a very good use of your resume and people look at that nowadays and say, well, of course references are available upon request. And so it makes you look like you haven't been on the market for a while. That is such a good example. I mean, that's absolutely on the last cover letter that I did. And if I were looking, I would have pulled that up and there it would have been. And I wouldn't have thought anything about it. Now, what about your LinkedIn profile? Tell me more about that. Because one of the things that um, uh, my clients talk about is, well, I ask them about is that they haven't touched LinkedIn, LinkedIn in probably two decades. That's funny that you say that because the first thing I wanted to say about that is it's not a situation where you set it and forget it. <laughs> so right. You definitely want to be active on LinkedIn. So you want to have a profile that's 100% complete. Uh, you want to have, you know, back to that, you know, making sure that you're looking current and relevant and that you're not dating yourself. You don't have to go back. 25 years on LinkedIn. You can go back just 15 years and you don't have to put the date of when you graduated, right? So it's not hiding something. It's just really editing and, you know, making sure that things that are on it are just the, re- the most relevant pieces for the type of role that you're targeting. And then it's really leveraging it to, you know, build your network, make sure that you nurture those relationships that you're building on LinkedIn, post updates, articles, comments, and then reach out to people and nurture those relationships. You know, about relationships on LinkedIn, so many people have like, at least a lot of women our age, because they haven't touched it in so long, they might have 50 contacts or 100 contacts. And I remember when I started to think about doing something else, I did go to LinkedIn. I hadn't touched it for 20 years. And I started to just think about different areas of my life that where I could add more people. So that was an interesting exercise. And I got myself comfortable and I tried to spend five to 10 minutes on it a day, just thinking about, well, who do I know from elementary school? Who do I know from university? Who do I know from when the kids played soccer? And I just kind of went through different chapters of my life because it's not like Facebook. You're not making friends with these people. You're nurturing business 
relationships and building a network. So can you talk a little bit about what you did to prepare your network for growing forward in your career? I think it's just not being afraid. Again, it's back to the fear, right? But it's not being afraid to reach out to people and to connect with them and to let them know that, you know, here you are, you're in a situation. In my case, I got laid off. I was looking for a new position. Just leveraging your network in the sense that people are there and they want to help you. And so reaching out to as many people as you can and letting them know that, you know, you're looking for a coffee networking type of event, or you just want to have a phone chat. People are so open to wanting to help you because so many people by now, actually in this day and age, so many people have gone through a layoff too. So I find like there's just a whole lot of empathy to the situation and to uh, understanding that it's important to have a network that's there to support you. You know, what I hear is going back to basics some basics, some basics are outdated, but other basics are really important. And I love that you touched on that we're just not comfortable reaching out, that fear does present itself that way too. So it's not that you have to be as comfortable reaching out to somebody in a networking meeting and actually talking. This is just with LinkedIn and a cup of coffee and just sending somebody a request. And I found it super fun to connect with people and to really think about you know, who do I know from that job that I had in the 80s? And who do I like, who do I remember? And what are they doing now? And you just never know what opportunities are going to come up from just this alone, just reconnecting with people from your past. It's so true. And you know, there are ways to on LinkedIn to reach out to people. You prize one of the Uh, job offers that I received was actually because I had applied, I had seen a role opened on LinkedIn, I applied for it, and then I didn't hear back. But what I did is I went and found a connection that worked for the company. I reached out to her because we had a lot of connections in common on LinkedIn. So I just found an opening to open up a dialogue. And lo and behold, she was 100% willing to meet with me. And she wasn't the hiring manager, but the next day I got a call for an interview with the company as a result of linking in and just really just treating people like people and and just communicating. That's really all it is. I love that. That's a great story. And I'm having another little flashback to somebody that I interviewed on the podcast who uh, was helping women our age date again with online dating. I heard it. I loved that podcast. (laughs) She was great. And and I'll, I'll refer to that podcast episode in the show notes. I don't have it handy now, but I was really struck by one of the back to basics she mentioned was to get comfortable smiling at strangers again. And I think this is really reminding me of that is just to get comfortable with a basic that you were very comfortable. We were very comfortable doing this sort of thing in our 20s when we were fresh graduates, right? But True. now, yeah, it's just something that that very basic thing about reaching out we're not as comfortable with and we have to, well, some of us aren't. The other thing that you mentioned is uh, nurturing your network. So what can you tell us about once you have these connections, what can you do to stay fresh and to have activity on your LinkedIn? It's really staying connected with people, staying in the loop. Um, You know, you see an update on someone that got a promotion, you know, congratulating them, sending them a personal note. It does take a little extra time, of course, to stay in touch with your network, but it's so worth it. And people appreciate it. And it does allow for you to stay top of mind with your network. And, you know, there's that reciprocity. I forget the I can't pronounce that term reciprocity. (laughs) That's it. That's it. The French Canadian is coming out now. (laughs) (laughs) I love that about you that you're French Canadian. I don't know many French Canadians. So it's always fun. So but tell me a little bit more about the networking on LinkedIn. Because One thing that really surprised me was how powerful it can be to search in your network. So what did you mean by that? You found somebody else who worked at the company. Tell us a little more about how you can do that. Well, LinkedIn is a very powerful search engine, in fact, and uh, there are certain features that are available for the free LinkedIn profile, but there's also other features, more advanced features that are available for certain premium uh, 
like a premium program that you pay a small monthly fee for. And there are searches that you can make in there that will allow you to search by the area, by the specific company, by the title, and then you're able to see who's currently working at certain companies or have previously worked at certain companies. And of course, the broader your network is on LinkedIn, there's something sort of magical that seems to happen when you have 500 plus people on LinkedIn, you're able to find connections of connections. There's, you know, second, third degree connections that you're able to um, LinkedIn with, of course, and you can also ask for introductions from people that you're directly connected to to some of your second and third degree connections. And so something magical happens there where you're able to really expand your network by leveraging those capabilities within LinkedIn. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's why <laughs> that's why I thought it was relevant to, to figure out, well, who do I remember from soccer? It's because that people have connections and their connections have connections and that this is all part of building your network. So it may not seem relevant at first, but it's really about uh, the breadth of your network. And it's funny, one of the things that I see my kids' friends also dealing with, it, they're kind of like midlife women. They don't appreciate LinkedIn and their networks are pathetic. So what I'm noticing with my kids who are in their early 20s is I'm taking it upon myself every time I talk to their friends to ask them about LinkedIn and all their friends are saying, oh yeah, I've been meaning to do that. And I'm like, yes, and you should be friends with me and all of your parents' friends because there, there's tons of networks there for you. So isn't that funny that we just have so much in common? Those guys don't know what they're doing either. It's true. And I saw this with a recent client of mine who's 24 and she also didn't have much going on with her LinkedIn profile. And after working together, she realized, well, now she has a new job actually, but people are contacting her on the strength of her her LinkedIn profile now. She never thought that that was possible because, you know, a lot of people just think they don't need LinkedIn unless they're looking for a new job. And until they're in that situation, they haven't really invested the time and energy in putting it together. But I think it's always a good time to be networking, as they say. And LinkedIn is the best way to do it. <laughs> it really is. Tell me a little bit about your profile picture and, and how that's important because I'm not an expert, but I've seen a lot of mistakes. Yes. Well, the profile picture, this is where LinkedIn is different from Facebook, let me just say. <laughs> so yes. Facebook, very acceptable, you know, to put something very much, um, just more with your hair down, I would say. But LinkedIn, of course, you want to have a professional picture. That is the picture that is going to be seen by potentially recruiters, hiring managers. So you want to make sure that it's clear who, who you are in the picture. There's just you in the picture and that it's very professional, that it represents your professional personal brand, so to speak, right? I think that is important. And it's important to have a picture as well. If you don't have a picture, I believe the statistics are there's 40% less views of your profile. Just if you don't have a picture, people will have the feeling that you're maybe hiding something or, you know, you're afraid to be seen for whatever reason. And so very important to have a professional picture. Yes, it really is. And there's also an opportunity to put even more visual there with that banner that's behind your professional picture. Yes, that helps too. And again, you should always think of it in terms of what's going to represent the professional you, your personal brand, you know, what you're able to deliver for a prospective employer. I can't believe you just mentioned personal brand because that was my next question. One of the things that um, I've seen with so many of us our age who have been laid off or lost our jobs or whatever, is that we haven't really uh, thought about our personal brand outside of our job titles. And I have seen that to be super important as we're figuring out what you started the interview with, which, which is what you really want and what's important to you. So if you have certain interests or if you're wanting to make some kind of a shift, a pivot, then it's really easy on LinkedIn to bring more of what you want into your LinkedIn profile by the groups that you're engaging in, by the um, articles that you're sharing. So can you talk to us a little bit about that, about thinking intentionally about how you want to represent yourself? For sure. Um, once you get clear on what it is that you want, LinkedIn being a search engine as well, 
it leverages, it uses a lot of keywords. So there'll be recruiters and hiring managers that may be looking for certain positions to fill and they'll be looking through keywords. So once you get that clarity for yourself of what you're looking for, but also what you're, you know, what you're bringing to the table, what your special skills and experiences are, and your secret sauce, you're able to incorporate that into your profile that allows for you to be found for those types of roles. I love that. So just being more strategic, more clear can really help you take that next step. So with three job offers, what happened next? Well, I ended up taking a job offer that looked to be the most fun in the end. (laughs) That really suited me at the time. And um, I did that for a while. And I also um, am working on my own business as well with uh, coaching uh, people, ambitious professionals that are really looking to up-level their careers. And so I'm able to, um, you know, dedicate the time to that now. Amazing. So how old are you now? 52. You're 52. I've really come a long way in terms of owning up to my age. (laughs) We are all about stigma busting when it comes to age. (laughs) At the Women in the Middle podcast. So did all this change happen for you in the last 10 years? Is that what it's been? I guess, yeah. Probably less than that. So you have pivoted and shifted your career using LinkedIn and uh, primarily. How many times? Two or three times now? A couple of times, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And it just sounds like it's really having the personal experiences is really helping you help your clients. Definitely. Yeah, that makes such a difference, right? Because um, I find a lot of people in my industry with career coaching, job search coaching, they have an HR background and they haven't had the experience that I've had on both sides of the interview desk, I like to call it, right? I've been the hiring manager and then I've been the interviewee so many times. It's a different perspective for sure. Oh, that's awesome. So what are some tips that you could give listeners who are thinking about up-leveling their career right now at their age? Well, Susie, I think it might help uh, if I may offer uh, another tip. It might help to think of yourself as the CEO in your career. Oh, I love that. (laughs) Treat your career like it's a business. And then you, you're basically an asset in that business. And it's an asset that needs to be developed, needs to be grown. But I think when you think of having that mindset of being the CEO, you're able to maybe make some decisions and some assessments that you may not otherwise make. You know, I love that. It sounds kind of obvious, but it's not at all. And one of the things I've noticed shifting from being employed to being an entrepreneur is that I've had to get more confidence and and really push myself to be a decision maker. So I appreciate that it is a a mindset shift to really embrace decision making, like intentional decision making about your career. I love that. So tell us, how can people get a hold of you? What are you promoting? Oh, thank you, Susie. Um, I actually uh, am promoting a brand new challenge and it is a LinkedIn challenge. So fun. (laughs) Yes. It's for people who either don't have a profile or do have one, but they are not using it and they need to spruce it up. And so it's a five-day challenge and people can sign up and uh, through my website, which is coachwithdanielle.com forward slash challenge is where they can sign up for that. It's a five-day challenge. And when they sign up, they will also get not only the five-day where I share all of the tips on how to get it done. It's very actionable. There's videos that accompany. There's a workbook. But I also talk about the real truth about LinkedIn and some tips that you can use to grow it, uh, to help you grow your career with it. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. Thank you so much. So many of my clients are going to be jumping on this offer. This challenge sounds great. Um, Thank you so much, Danielle. I was so happy when I realized I wanted to do something about LinkedIn and about up-leveling and about career change. And I just can't believe that I forgot you were a main resource in my community. So thank you so much. (laughs) Thanks for joining us on the Women in the Middle podcast. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to be on the podcast, Susie. I love your podcast. 
That's it for this episode. I'm sure you'll agree Danielle has been in the trenches when it comes to up-leveling her career and looking for new opportunities. She has figured it out, LinkedIn and all. She knows firsthand that there's life on the other side of the layoff. So do I. And it is amazing. (laughs) She also knows that you really can do this. Midlife is just full of opportunity, even now at your age. Conducting a job search can seem foreign when you haven't been looking for work in quite some time, especially post-internet. Things really have changed. But there are solid strategies to use to make sure that you use your vast experience in your favor. I love Danielle's advice to think carefully about what you want to accomplish, even during the phase of the job search itself. And also to really look at basics like building a network, like what's on your profile picture in LinkedIn. If you're afraid of reaching out the way you need to during a job search, you really have to think about why and if you like your reasons for resisting such a solid strategy, such a basic thing like this. Going back to basics is exactly what you have to do, but you have to make sure the basics are up to date. (laughs) Okay, so my focus as a midlife coach is to help you get excited about your life again. Being the queen of your brain domain is the very best way to be. I really believe that. Check out the show notes with more information and links at suzyrosenstein.com. Download my free ebook, Nine Secrets to Get Unstuck in Your 50s at suzyrosenstein.com forward slash nine secrets. And whenever you're ready, there are three great ways I can help you learn to think on purpose so that you can get excited about your life again this year. The first way is to join the free Women in the Middle community Facebook group and connect with other amazing midlife women who are ready to start regret proofing right along with you. Just go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash women in the middle community. The second way is to work with me directly and get unbelievably effective coaching to take you from being stuck and confused to being crystal clear and excited about your future. So grab your free kickstart call right away at talk to Suzy.com. And the third way is to get on the wait list for my new midlife membership. This is an upbeat virtual community for 50 plus women who want clarity, courage, and connection to get excited about their lives again. You are not alone. Sign up at suzyrosenstein.com forward slash membership. Let's do this, ladies. Let's think on purpose. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next week. <music> 